Welcome to our lecture about the two sample t test. You're going to learn how to make inferences about means from two separate populations. We've already learned to use the z statistic for inferences about means of two groups. Now we're going to learn to do the same thing with the t statistic. When do we use z and when do we use t? The rules are exactly the same as what we learned uh, in one, one sample uh, statistical inference, making inferences using one sample from one population. Uh, if you want to review, learn more about it, go back to that lecture. Uh, the pr probably it's, it's more likely to be in the one, the one sample uh, t-statistic lecture using the t-test. Basically, to summarize, if you know uh, sigma from the two groups, sigma 1 and sigma 2, you have no problem. Just use the z. If you have a large sample size in both together, n1 and n2, and again, as before, what does large mean? It would, might have to do with the policy of the decision maker, and in this case, the decision maker is your instructor if you're taking the class in a formal setting. If you have a large enough sample size, use the z. The problem arises if you don't know the population standard deviation, and usually you don't, and if your sample size is just not large enough for whatever reason, you were not able to collect enough data, which happens very often. Data is very expensive, and sometimes in the process of collecting data, you're actually destroying the objects. So um, it happens quite frequently. So what do we do? Well, then we would like to use the t distribution as an approximation to the z. But again, as before, we have that additional caveat that in order to use the t, we also have to know that the underlying population is normally distributed. If we don't know that, often what we're doing is making that assumption. We're saying, well, sigma 1 and sigma 2 are not known. My samples, n1 and n2, my sample sizes are small. Uh, and I'm going to assume that the underlying populations are normally distributed. There are situations where we know for sure we can't assume that because we have some knowledge from previous research about the shape of the distribution. And then we have to work with other methods, uh, non-parametric or distribution-free methods, uh, which is not a topic for this class. You'll notice that the formula we use to um, get the calculated value of the test statistic, um, that's a t with n1 plus n2 minus 2 degrees of freedom, uh, it has another value in it that has to be computed first. That's the pooled variance. Otherwise, things look kind of familiar. Uh, we have x1 bar minus x2 bar, so the difference between the two uh, sample means. Uh, then we have divided by the square root of, there's that pooled variance, times 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. So before you uh, compute the calculated value of z, you have a, a, um, an interim value. You have to get the pooled variance first. The pooled variance is really an average variance, but since n1 and n2 don't have to be the same size, it's a, a weighted average uh, by sample size. That's really all it is. If n1 and n2 are the same size, then what you're doing is you're getting an average uh, of the two, the average variance of the two uh, samples. Um, and you can see how we calculate S2 pooled over there. Uh, we have, uh, we're using degrees of freedom. We're weighting by degrees of freedom. So N1 minus 1 divided by the total degrees of freedom uh, is, is the weight for um, the variance of group 1. N2 minus 1 divided by the total degrees of freedom is the weight that we use for the uh, sample variance of group two. Now we want to introduce um, yet another assumption we're going to be making and not testing in this class. Uh, and it's called homoscedasticity. 
Um, what we're doing here is we're saying we know uh, that for us to be able to do this test, uh, the two variances really have to be the same. We're assuming that the two population variances are really the same, are really equal. Now, like anything else, uh, we could test for this. The, the, uh, this parameter would be um, sigma or sigma squared. And we'd be testing. The null hypothesis would be that sigma um, squared 1, sigma squared from group 1, is equal to uh, the variance from group 2. Uh, we're not doing that in this course. Uh, so the only thing you can do right now in order to, uh, to finish the problems and to do the exercises is to assume that if you had done the test, they would be the same. And one, of the, one thing that would be nice, it doesn't always happen, is that if the exercises that you do would say, um, you know, we assume that the two variances really are the same. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're doing a problem and there's a follow-up question, what assumptions uh, did you have to make in order to do this problem? And it's a, a two-sample t-test. Well, well, you have a few now. You're assuming a uh, normally distributed population. You're assuming that the variances of the two groups are actually equal. Uh, you don't know what they are, but and you have different sample variances, but you're assuming that the difference in the sample variances is due to uh, sampling variation uh, rather than uh, to, to the two population variances actually not being equal. Um, if we were going to learn how to test for homoscedasticity, it would be something called an F-test. Uh, certainly, any statistical software you use will do it. Um, and you will learn about this in other courses. In problem one, we're comparing the reading scores of two groups, men and women. And we note that the uh, women, the, their scores, average score is four, uh, 84 compared to the 80 for the men. That's a four-point difference. The question is whether that four-point difference is significant or it might just simply be chance or sampling error. Okay, so we're going to test whether this is significant. Now, notice the sample sizes, 16 and 15. Even under HO, where you say that there's no difference, you've got a sample size of 16 plus 15 of 31. We'll see in a moment that's 29 degrees of freedom. You cannot use Z since you don't know sigma. So you're going to have to use T, a two-sample t-test. HO is that mu1 equals mu2, which is the same as saying no difference. H1 is that mu1 is not equal to mu2. Now this is a t with 29 degrees of freedom. We lose two degrees of freedom because it's n1 plus n2 minus 2. It's a mathematical adjustment, in effect. You have 29 degrees of freedom. And look at the critical value, t29, and you have O25 in the right tail two-tail test, 025 in the left tail. And notice it's not 1.96 and minus 1.96, which it would be if this were a Z. Since it's T29, which is not quite a Z yet, the critical values are 2.0452 and negative 2.0452. These numbers come from the T table. You look for 025 in a tail, and you look at 29 degrees of freedom, and you'll see the value 2.0452. As a check, go to infinity, when t infinity is z, and you'll note that the value will be the familiar 1.96 and minus 1.96. When you're using the t-test, you're going to have to first calculate s squared pooled. Now, s squared pooled is the HO is that there's no difference, make it into one group. If you take the raw data and put it into one group, you'd have 31 numbers, of course, then you'd be getting the S squared pooled. But if you don't have the raw data, so you just have S1 squared and S2 squared, then uh, you use this formula, N1 minus 1, so you got 15 times S1 squared to 256, N1 minus, uh, N2 minus 1, which is 14, times the uh, S2 squared, which is 400, divided by 29, and this is essentially a kind of a weighted average. This is a weighted average of the two variances, the group one and group two, and you end up with 325.5, okay? And notice it's right sort of in the middle between S1 squared of 256 and S2 squared of 400. And then now you can do the 
calculation of the T29. And you see it's 80 minus 84, it's a minus 4, that's the difference between the two groups. And then in the denominator, first do 1 over 16 plus 1 over 15, do that first, times it by 325.5, uh, take the square root of that, that's the square root of 42.04, which is 6.48. Your, your T29, that's your sample, sample evidence basically, is negative 0.62. Clearly, you're not in the rejection region, and you have no evidence to reject HO. In simple English, there's no significant difference between men and women on these test scores. Here we're comparing. This is problem two. We want to know this if the salaries are different in two companies. Actually, this is daily, uh, the daily wage. We take a sample of 30 people, 10 from company one, 20 from company two. And notice that the average in company one was 210, daily pay. For company two was 175. Before you can make any conclusion, like saying, oh, company one pays more than company two, based on your sample evidence, before you can do that, you're going to have to test the significance. All right? So you're noticing a, uh, basically a $35 difference, but that could just very well be sampling error. Okay, H O is mu one equals mu two. H one is mu one not equal to mu two. This is a two-tailed test. We have we're testing at the alpha of O one. We cut the O one in half, so we have 0.05 in the right tail, 0.005 in the left tail, and this is T twenty eight. And notice the critical value for T twenty eight. Get it off the table. Look at twenty eight and look at O O five in the tail, and you'll find that the critical value is two point seven six three three. It's symmetric, so on the left it's also negative. 2.763. Those are the critical values. Okay, step the next step is to get this S squared pooled. So we got to take n1 minus 1, which is 9 times 625. 625, of course, is the S1 squared. And then we take n2 minus 1, which is 19. 20 minus 1 is 19, times the S2 squared of 400, divide by 28, which is the degrees of freedom. And then you get a weighted average of 472.3. That's called S squared pooled. Okay, we put that into the formula. We have T28 equals 210 minus 175. That's the $35 difference that we observed. And now we have the standard error for the difference, which is first you do the 1 over 10, 1 over N1 plus 1 over N2, 1 tenth plus 1 twentieth. Calculate that first. Times it by 472.3. You get the square root of 70.845. It's 35 over 8.42. You get a T28 value of 4.16. That's your calculated T. That's essentially your sample evidence. Okay, and now we, we turn the sample evidence into a T value of 4.16, and we indeed find it's in the rejection region. Our conclusion is that that $35 difference between the two companies is a significant difference. So company A pays more than company B. In this problem, we're looking at uh, two suppliers of concrete beams. And um, what the, the metric we're looking at is the strength of the beams. We want to know if the two suppliers are basically equivalent or if we should purchase from one rather than the other. Um, strength is measured in pounds per square inch of pressure. And what we want to know is, is there a significant difference between the beam supplied by supplier A and supplier B with regard to the strength of the concrete beams. Um, we see that um, the, the two averages, the two sample averages are 5,000 uh, pounds per square inch versus 49.75 pounds per square inch. Uh, that's a 25 PSI difference. Is that difference real and reflects the fact that the two suppliers really do make concrete beams with different strengths? Or is that just sampling error, and it, it could have happened um, due to, uh, you know, the randomness inherent in the world? Uh, we're going to do this test at an alpha of 0.05, and we'll do that on the next slide. The null hypothesis is that mu1 is equal to mu2. There's no difference. The alternate hypothesis is that the two uh, population means really are different. 
Uh, the, we're using a, a T with 20 degrees of freedom. Uh, the uh, sample one plus uh, sample size two minus two, that's where we get the 20 from. With an alpha 0.05, it's split equally, it's a two tail test. Uh, we have 0 0.025 in one tail, 0 0.025 in the other tail. And so when you look this up in the T table to get the critical values that you see here, you're looking at the um, 20th row, degrees of freedom 20, and uh, the column for 0.025 tail probability. And you find that the critical values are plus and minus 2.086. And that's going to be your decision rule for the test. If you're in the red shaded area, if your calculated value of the statistic is in the red shaded area, um, you'll reject the null hypothesis. You'll say it's too far away uh, from the mean of zero. Uh, if it's in the white unshaded area, you'll say, well, I can't reject. It could be. It could be. Uh, how do we get the calculated value? Again, the first thing you need is to get the pooled variance. It's kind of like an average variance weighted by degrees of freedom. That's 2995. And then uh, we use the formula to get the calculated value of the T statistic. Uh, you see the difference between the two averages, 25. Um, you end up dividing by 23.4. I'll leave it to you to, um, on your own, do that formula, make sure that my work is correct. And you end up with a T20 value, calculated value of 1.07. Aha, that's in the unshaded area. It wasn't beyond 2.086 on the one side. It wasn't beyond negative 2.086 on the other side. So the conclusion is do not reject HO. There is no statistically significant difference between uh, the means of the of um, pounds um, per square inch of pressure between the, the strengths of the two suppliers of concrete beams. Um, the difference we observed, which was actually a pretty small difference, was just due to random variation. We're going to also use uh, Microsoft Excel to solve uh, two sample t-tests. Um, one of the reasons is, as you can see, the calculations are doable but formidable. Um, and so we do rely more on statistical software. We don't want to use uh, pencil and paper and calculator for problems like this if we don't have to. Uh, re remember, you can um, figure this out in many different ways. There are a lot of online uh, resources for using MS Excel uh, to solve statistics problems. Um, we have some very, very simple instructions in uh, uh, text form and in uh, video form uh, on the uh, handouts page of our website. Uh, please feel free to use it. Let us know how it works for you. We're going to use Excel to answer the question whether uh, men and women spend the same amount on wine. It's well known that men spend a lot more on beer than women, but how about wine? And the researcher took a sample of 34 people, 17 happened to be women and 17 were men, and they found that the average amount spent on wine this is pre in a year, by women was $437.47. The average amount spent by men was 552.94. Okay, the raw data is on the right. You can see it. Again, this represents the uh, uh, spending habits on wine for men and women, and there were 34 of them. So the real question here is, is this difference statistically significant? And we're going to solve it using Excel. Again, we have the raw data here. We have the, you know, we're not just giving it, reporting the mean and the standard deviation. We're showing you the raw data. Anyway, this is the Excel printout. You can do it yourself and you'll see. Now, Excel calls it variable one and variable two. There's a way to put in what it is, but, you know, we know that variable one was the women. That was group one. Variable two is the men. And you can see the means. The first row shows you the mean. And you don't need so many decimal places, but I want you to see the printout as it appears. So we see 437.47 for variable 2, which is the men, was 552.94. We see the variances. We see the observations, 17 and 17. The pooled variance, 
So you don't have to do all that arithmetic. It's right there. There's your pooled variance. Notice it's between the two variances, kind of a weighted average. And that's 101.002.8493. HO is that there's no difference. It's mu1 equals mu2 is another way of saying mu1 minus mu2 is zero. That's a default. Okay, so the hypo and all hypothesis is mu1 equals mu2, no difference. Notice the degrees of freedom are 32, 17 plus 17 minus 2. And your calculated t, this is if you do all the arithmetic, this is your calculated t, your computed t. Notice it's minus 1.059. Oh, we'll round it to minus 1.06. Now, we, we did it as a two-tailed test. You can ignore the next two rows. It's just one tail. We, we, doing, we always do this as a two-tailed test. So let's look at the two-tailed. Now, you see the critical values. We get this off the table. We don't have so many decimal places. The critical values, if you looked at our table for T32, you'd see it's 2.0369. This is, you know, Excel has many more decimal places. So it's showing you the critical values. On the right side, it would be plus 2.0369316619. And on the left tail, it would be minus 2.0369316619. This is we have 025 in each tail. It's doing this at the 05 level. So 025 in the right tail. So clearly, you know that the T stat is not in the rejection region. It hasn't gone beyond minus 2.0369. If you draw it, you'll see it kind of in the what we call the um, white area, the unshaded area, okay? But Excel does a better job than just that. This is the way we were doing it. We see if the calculated T is in the rejection region or not. It actually gives you the probability of getting the sample evidence. And it shows you that probability is not less than 05. It actually is the point two nine seven three nine nine two eight eight. Let's just call it about 0.30, 30% chance. We'll see in a moment what that represents. But you know you're not below 05. You've got a 30% chance of getting the sample evidence or an uh, even bigger difference You know, um, if HO is true. It's telling you what is the likelihood of getting the sample evidence if HO is true. Anyway, we clipped a little piece of the output. We This is really what all you look at if you're a statistician. You look at the... P, that's the probability of getting the sample evidence or something more extreme if HO is true. And you see the value there is 0.297, or let's just call it 0.30, okay? Now, you don't have to be a mathematician to know 0.30 is not less than 0.05. The 30% chance of getting this sample evidence if HO is true, okay, so it's not so unusual. That's why we have no evidence to reject. It could very well be a sampling error. So this is we don't reject if you see that probability there, and that's based, of course, on the uh, the calculated t that we got. Okay, the calculated t was not in the rejection region, so the probability is 30, 0.30, and um, so basically you know right away just by looking at that probability, since it's more than 0.05, you don't have a significant difference. And there's your conclusion on the bottom. There's no statistically significant difference between men and women and how much how much they spend on wine consumption. If you look at the printout and you want to know why, we should calculate a T statistic. That's if you did all the mathematics, turning the sample evidence into T. Why was it minus, I'm call just minus 1.06? I'm going to round it. Okay, why was it a negative number? It's only because you made the women first. You put them in the in group one. And the women spend less, so you get a negative number. If you reversed it and you made the men first, and they became the first variable, then you have positive. It doesn't make a difference because it's symmetrical, so you still won't be rejecting. Okay, now the question is, what would the calculated t-value have to be for us to reject it? Well, it gives you the, the critical value for the two-tail, if you're doing a two-tail test. And it said it was 2.0369316. So to reject HO, you need a calculated t value of either more than 2.03693 or whatever, basically like two, let's say 2.04, 2.07, 2.10, .2 something more than 2.0369, or less than if you're on the, rejecting on the other side, on the negative side, 
then you'd have to have a value less than negative 2.03693, etc., which is the critical value. So, for example, negative uh, 2.5, you'd be rejecting. You'd see that the probability is less than 0.5. This is problem two. We're looking at job satisfaction scores. And we took a random sample of white and non-white employees. And again, there's the raw data. The higher the value, the more satisfied you are. And if your score is a zero, that means you're not happy. Okay, so we see the raw data here. And uh, you notice among whites, the scores appear to be a little higher, but we're not sure yet. That's why we want a statistical test. So is there a difference between the two groups, white and non-white employees, with regard to job satisfaction. We're gonna test at the alpha O5, and the HO again is a mu1 equals mu2, which is another way of saying mu1 minus mu2 is zero, no difference, and it's gonna be a two-tailed test. Well, let's look at the, uh, the the numbers. Really, you look at these, the probability, but, um, and indeed, if I, that's what a statistician would look at first, probably. Look at the probability, that's next to the last row where it says probability capital T is less than or equal to lowercase t. Two tail. You only get interested in two tail because we're doing two tail tests. And notice that probability is 0 0.001, etc. It's basically it's significant at the 05 level. This is a probability of 001, one in one in ten thousand roughly. I'm sorry, one in a thousand roughly. Okay, one in a thousand is less than 05. Okay, so we know it's significant. So we know the difference between those two means are significant. Now we can look at the means because we know they're different. Okay, variable one was white employees. Their job satisfaction on average, and I'm rounding, is 6.17. Non-white employees, their job satisfaction, and again I'm rounding, is 3.56. So we have a difference of 6.17 versus 3.56. We know it's significant. It's a significant difference. It's not explainable by chance. There. We see the variances, 4.735, 5.08, uh, round, 5.085, okay, and we notice there's 18 employees in group one, which was the, the white employees, the non-white employees, 18 of them, okay, that's, we had a total sample size of 36, we lose two degrees of freedom, notice the degrees of freedom are 34. There's your pooled variance, 4.91. And it's kind of, again, sort of in the middle between 4.735 and 5.0849. So that's why it's called a pooled variance. And then the calculated T. The calculated T is 3.535. That's the calculated, yeah, that's turning the sample evidence into a T statistic. Okay, so T stat is 3.535, and you see right away it's, it's outside of the, uh, the uh, it's in the rejection region. How do I know? Because the T critical, two tail, the last row on the printout is 2.032. Anything more than that, we're gonna be rejecting. If you reject on the left side, anything less than 2.032, we'd be rejecting on the left. But in this case, we see we clearly reject, and I didn't even need to look at the critical values. Once I saw that probability there, and again, it's the probability of capital T less than or equal to lowercase t two tail, it's 0 0.001. I knew right away I have a significant difference. So in simple English, you look at this printout, you say the uh, two groups, the white and non-white people, do not have the same job satisfaction. There is significant difference. So the difference between 6.17 job satisfaction versus 3.56, which of course the latter one is the non-white employees is different. And we should investigate why are non-white employees unhappy at this company. This essentially you know, repeats what I've told you. White employees have more job satisfaction than non-white individuals. Now the company might say, well, it's only a sample of 36 and they have thousands of people working at the company. Well, you don't buy that. That's the whole point of uh, statistics, is to make sure you're not looking at chance or sampling error. And the printout tells us clearly this is not what's supposed to happen. Okay, so we did a two-tailed test. And the probability of getting this kind of sample evidence, if there is no difference between whites and non-whites, the probability of getting this sample evidence is point zero or something more extreme, actually, is point zero zero one two. 
In other words, if white and non-white employees feel the same, have the same job satisfaction score, there's only 12 out of 10,000 chances of getting the sample evidence. In other words, this is not what's supposed to happen. With testing at the O5 level, we are going to reject. And basically, in simple English, you tell your boss, the difference is significant. It's not explainable by sampling error or chance. There is a difference. White employees seem to have higher job satisfaction than non-white employees. And again, as I said before, you're going to try to investigate why this is true. Anyway, this uh, slide just summarizes. And basically, what you tell your boss, you found a difference of 2.61. Remember, this is a, a 0 to 10 scale. So 2.61 is quite a bit on a 0 to 10 scale. We found a difference. The likelihood of getting this is um, a lot less than 0.05. In fact, it's 0 0.0012. We reject HO. We tell the boss the two groups are not the same when it comes to job satisfaction. And we should try to investigate. Okay, so in simple English, we reject HO, and we're convinced that this is not sampling error. There's a serious difference between job satisfaction scores of white and non-white employees. Until now, we've been doing um, two-tailed tests where we'll reject either on the high side or the low side. Here's an example of one uh, which is a one-tailed problem. Uh, does a chip made by company X have a longer life than the chip made by company Y. Company X thinks it does, and it wants to prove that. So let's see what happens. Here's the data, um, a sample of 16 uh, company X, a sample of 14 company Y, um, two uh, sample standard deviations, uh, two sample um, averages, 6.8 years for company X, 6.1 years for company Y. We're using a significance level of 0.05. And of course, we're assuming equal variances. We're, we have all the assumptions we have to make in order to use um, the T distribution. Okay, note how we set up the HO and the H1. HO, that's our straw man, is saying that company X the average life of its chips is less than out of company Y. Of course, the company has been claiming the opposite. They want to reject that. So H1 is what they've been saying, that company X, the average life of its chip, is uh, longer, greater than company Y. Again, notice the rejection region is where H1 is pointing on the right. Now, since we have T28 degrees of freedom, 16 plus 14 minus 2, which is T28, and if 05 in the right tail, the critical value is 1.7011. And again, we'll look at a T with 28 degrees of freedom. Okay, we, you can see how we calculated the S squared pooled. Remember, it's kind of like the average, a sort of weighted average of the two variances for the two groups, company X, company Y. And we see that S squared pool is 0.731. And notice the T28, we end up with a T value of 2.24, which is in the rejection region. The probability is less than 05. And our conclusion is we reject the HO. Okay, we shut the straw man down, and it turns out comp the computer chips made by company X do have a longer life than those manufactured by company Y. Okay, in this problem, looking at a pharmaceutical company. They're testing a new weight loss drug. They're claiming that people will lose weight if they take this drug with their meals. Okay, we take a random sample of 10 people. Notice you have the before weight and the after weight. So these are not two independent samples. This is either called a paired two sample t-test or a matched t-test. But you have to remember though, it's not 20 people. We're looking at 10 people and looking at a change. And you can see how much they, uh, what the change was. The first subject went from 130 pounds to 125. The second subject went from 125 to 120. And we're going to test this for significance. You have noticed already that uh, even though this problem is in a, a lecture about two samples, this is not really two samples at all. It's matched, but it's one sample with two metrics, two values 
uh, taken uh, from each subject, one the before weight, and then three months later, the after weight. And so if we compute the difference, um, which could be a loss, could be a gain, right? If you compute the difference, that's one, one variable. Um, and it's then everything reduces to whatever we learned earlier in the lecture on um, one regular, one sample uh, testing. Um, but it's, it's considered part of this uh, lecture. Uh, it's not, it's paired or matched um, testing. Uh, so you can see how the, the data table um, works out. You can do this in Excel uh, by hand, or you can have Excel do it for you. We have a, you can find some problems uh, that are worked out. And what do we have? Before, um, after, you, we take the after minus the before, that's the difference. Uh, we get the uh, average difference. You can see it on the, the box on the, the top right. Uh, because the differences add up to negative 40, divide that by 10, the average uh, difference in weight is a loss of four pounds. That sounds good for the company, right? Um, to get the uh, standard deviation, you use the formula for standard deviation, which you can see laid out over there in terms of D. Uh, we end up um, uh, adding up all the deviations squared you get 80 divided by n minus 1. All of that goes under a square root. And so the standard deviation is 2.98 pounds. And now we have to use this in order to do the hypothesis test. You can see how this looks exactly like um, a one sample uh, test. Our null hypothesis is that the uh, mu of the difference is 0. Uh, in other words, the null hypothesis is no difference um, using the drug. The before and the after weight are, are the same, not significantly different. Um, the um, alternate hypothesis, H1, is that there is a difference. We'll reject either way, either if the weight loss drug works in its intended way or if it works in the opposite of its intended way. So in this case, um, we're going to reject the null hypothesis if we find a, a, a loss that's too high or too low. And uh, you see the, um, the T formula uh, laid out and, and worked out. Um, it ends up being negative 4.25. That's a very, very uh, large uh, value. It's way into the region of rejection on the left side. Um, so yes, uh, definitely we reject the null hypothesis. The conclusion is that the average weight loss of four pounds is statistically significant um, at the alpha equals 0.05 level. And even more, you can see the p-value is 0 0.0022. Thank you for attending our lecture. As always, once you learn the material, Find as many problems as you can and practice, practice, practice.